So the first thing is how do you prepare uh, to for how you prepare yourself to find a research experience. And the very very first thing is what we did um, in your first uh, in your in your transition program to college, which is uh, prepare a resume. You really need to have uh, the lighting is a, a little messed up. Hold on. You really need to have a, a good and complete resume in order to uh, find a research experience. That's something when you when you're applying for a research experience with a whether it's a faculty member at Randolph College or whether it's a um, uh, somebody at a local company or or whether it's a faculty member through something like the NSF Research Experience for Undergraduates, the REU, um, you're going to want to put a professional face forward. Um, and what I mean by that is when you communicate with faculty members, um, there. Actually, let me take a step back and say, you're going to need to communicate with faculty members. You're going to need to communicate with um, what do you call them? Um, you know, managers at companies. Whether it's a faculty member at Randolph College, a faculty member um, through a, a partner university through the NSFRU, or whether it's a, a manager. Um, at at BWXT, um, Framatome, um, at the local vet, um, at uh, at the MRI clinic, um, at Centra, wherever you go, you're going to need to communicate, and you and and I'm here to tell you today that you are going to want to put a professional face forward. You do not want to underestimate how professional you want to be when you communicate, whether it's with me about a research experience or whether it's with, um, you know, a, a surgeon at Centra um, or a, 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 a whoever. Anyway, um, so you really do want to practice being professional. Um, and the first thing that you really need to do is make sure that you have a resume prepared. We started the resume process last year. I hope that you created something of a resume, but this year you need to have a final resume. You need to have a resume done. And when I say final resume, your resume is going to be something that you create um, over your four years here. It's, it's a work in progress. It's never done. My resume is not done. Um, my resume is updated every year. Um, if not more frequently. Actually, it's usually updated more frequently because every time I apply for a grant, I have to submit a resume. Every time I apply for a job, um, you know, some kind of consulting work, I have to use a resume. Every time, uh, every year, the college uh, requires me to submit uh, an updated resume. It gets updated all the time. So that's something which, it's a work in progress, but you really need to have um, a starting product at this point. So the homework for this week is um, because the resume is the essential first point. Um, the homework for this week is to complete a resume and submit it on Moodle. So you need a one-page resume. So that's something which, well, I guess we can discuss right now, that for pretty much um, your, your entire college career and for probably some time after, you never want your resume to be more than one page. So that means that you maybe have to have um, what's what may, may you might consider a working resume, right? So a resume with everything on it, to put everything you can possibly think of on your resume in terms of experience, in terms of I worked at Pizza Hut, or I, you know, I, or I know how to program in MATLAB, and put a, a, every range of thing on it, and then you tailor that resume for a certain job or for a certain position or for a certain um, thing that you're applying for. Um, and so you cut it down to one page every time you want to use it professionally. So it's okay to have more than one page in terms of um, what you have uh, to, to work with, but when you send it out, it should never be more than one page. Never be more than one page. That's really important. People are just typically not going to read them if they're longer than a page. I mean, that's. I mean, yeah, maybe I will, but, um, you know, you, you shouldn't count on anybody reading beyond a page. Um, so I guess what, what I want you to submit for next week, it could be longer than a page if you have more to say, but I think for more of you, it, you'll actually have trouble filling a page, and you do want to try to try to sort of fill a page. You don't want it to be a half page. Um, but I do want a resume, something that you could build off of, that you could use uh, to apply for a research experience. Because you got to start applying for research experiences for this summer, really by the end of this semester. So a resume 
um, submit it on Moodle by the end of the week. If you need help with your resume, you can always ask Shank, Dr. Shank, Dr. Soika, or me. Um, or really, you do want to, um, if at all possible, I know that you know having 22 of you communicate with uh, the CDC within the next week might be difficult, but you do want to communicate, especially if you haven't communicated with um, Megan, uh, in the CDC about your resume since she talked to you about it uh, a year ago, more than a year ago. You really want to um, communicate with her about your resume. Tell her you're finishing your resume. Ask her for an appointment to discuss your resume um, and, uh, and have her look at your resume. Um, but in addition, when you're applying for research positions, before you ever send out that resume, you really want one of your faculty advisors to look it over and make sure that it's appropriate for the position that you're applying for. That's the one thing that the CDC maybe can't do quite as well, is discuss whether it's appropriate for that particular position. Your faculty advisors can do a better job um, tailoring uh, a final product. So, <clears throat> so the resume is really important. I don't, I'm not going to talk about what goes into a resume because that was done through the CDC session and hopefully you have that. But if you, um, if you are behind in that process, you're going to want to um, go on to the CDC website, the, the Career Development Center here at Randolph College, um, and look into creating a resume, communicate with um, the director of the Career Development Center, Megan Cruz Fallon. Um, about that or communicate with one of our of the faculty members but okay so that being said resume is due in one week by next Friday you must submit a resume um, on Moodle okay so what's the next step the next step what's the next step so the next step is is identifying a faculty mentor we're actually going to talk later in the semester about identifying a faculty mentor about how you find a faculty mentor um, we'll talk more about it later in the semester um, but today I'm really talking about the communication once you have identified that faculty mentor then uh, how do you communicate and I'll just say you know as a sort of a prelude to the next discussion on how you find a faculty mentor and how you profile a faculty mentor, that's another topic that we talk about later, is that you really want to profile a faculty mentor. You want to understand for yourself. You don't want to ask a faculty, what do you do? That's just, that's, that's just, that's just you being uninformed. You want to actually do a little bit of research into the faculty and the, and the research that they're doing. You want to be informed. You want to profile those faculty before you ever talk to them. And you want to say, ooh, I know you do this. I am interested in this. That's, really, that's another really important part about finding research. When you're applying for an NSF REU outside of this college, um, you have to say why you're interested in what they're studying. Um, you don't just say, oh, I'll just do anything. You, know? you, you really need to uh, understand what they're doing um, and express an interest in what they're doing. Okay, so, so, there's, so there's a number of steps. Finding a faculty mentor, how do you find a faculty mentor? Profiling a faculty mentor, really learning about the research that they do, um, whether it's a faculty mentor, whether it's at a company, um, and then communicating. Um, and, uh, and, and one more thing, and t today again, I want to just take a little more time to talk about communicating. Um, but, but how do you find a faculty mentor? Again, we'll talk about it later more, but really, you just want to cast a wide net. When you, you, you need to do research experiences before you graduate, how do you do it? You need to cast a wide net. You need to talk to faculty in your department, outside of your department. You need to do research on the internet about other faculty. And again, when I say faculty and research, I really mean more generally jobs, internships, managers at companies, etc. But I'm going to focus with the words on faculty and research. You want to... Um, cast a wide net, see what's out there, and then communicate with them. Let's talk about the communication. So the communication aspect is really much more important than you would often give it credit. Um, faculty are getting asked to do research all the time by students and depending on where you are, you know, there may be um, 10 students who want to do research with one faculty member. I mean, there's just, there's, right, there's, there's 
10 students for every faculty member um, or 12 or 15 or you know depending on where you are um, and uh, and then there's not a lot and not, not, not all faculty do research so um, you need to uh, so so therefore you know so like uh, um, for example I know you know in the bi in the biology department here at the college uh, not all the faculty I mean, all the faculty are doing some sort of research, but not all the faculty, faculty actively do research with students all the time. So if you want to do summer research with a biology member and in, in, with a faculty member in biology, um, then you know there may only be two faculty members in any given summer who want to do research, but there are 30 or 40 biology uh, majors and uh, those two faculty are not going to be doing research with more than one or two students so there's a lot of students who want who, who, who really need to be doing research and not a lot of faculty members so you want to put your best foot forward right that's my point um, and so you need to stand out what I mean by stand out, right? I mean it's it's up to you to find a research experience. It's not really while well, well, in the super program we really want to help you find research experiences. It's up to you to find a research experience. It's your job to do that, and you need to do that for yourself. Um, and how do you stand out? How do you stand out? You stand out. Uh, think about it for yourself, right? What do you think? How, what are the things that you can do to stand out? If we were having a discussion today, which this 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 would be much better as a discussion than a lecture, and I apologize for that because uh, it gets a little old hearing me repeat myself when really you would learn better with a discussion, but that's okay, that's where we are today. Um, what you, uh, so where were we, yeah, yeah, how do you stand out? Think about that for yourself, think about the ways that you can stand out. Um, but I will give you my answer, and my answer is, um, is clear and uh, good communication. That's the biggest, the biggest way you can stand out. How do you find a research experience? You're gonna find a research experience, sure, by walking up to somebody and talking to them, but primarily, you're gonna find research experiences and internships uh, via electronic communication. That's the primary way we go these days with electronic communication um, and uh, really starting a conversation by email. The first thing is you're going to start a conversation probably by email. Sure, you can, uh, you know, on a, on a good day, uh, or on, a, on a good day that we're, you know, meaning if we were actually in person, it would be a good day. Um, you could walk up to my office door and and talk to me, um, say, "Ooh, hey, Dr. Sheldon, I see you're in today. I'd like to talk to you about research." Absolutely, talking in person is great. Um, but more often, more often than not, the communication is going to start with an email. So the fact that the communication is going to start with an email is you really need to think about. You really need to think about email etiquette. That is important. Don't don't brush it off, right? Email etiquette. What do I mean by email etiquette? Um, you need to think about first of all how you communicate via email. This is, this is a really important thing that you learn um, as an undergraduate is that email communication, professional email communication is really an essential thing for you to learn. And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, you've got to respond to emails. You can't, you can't be ignoring your emails. You're never going to find a, a research experience, a job, a grad school, or whatever if you can't manage your email. That's the first thing, and you guys know that's a pet peeve of mine, is, is when you don't respond to emails, when you don't respond appropriately. Um, you've got to learn to manage your email, and that's one of the discussions we would normally have is how do you manage email? Because sometimes, sure, you're getting tons of email, uh, it's hard to manage it across, you know, with your coursework, etc. Um, but you've just got to read and respond appropriately without a discussion about the various ways to manage email and the various electronic, um, you know, like things like one of the things that we talked recently with IT about that the new super program is is how to appropriately filter your email in Gmail. If you're interested in that. Talk to IT. IT can help you out with sorting email. If you find that your Gmail box is too complicated or too many things or you 
can't figure out the best way to sort it, talk to IT. They can help you. They've got some really good ideas about filtering in Gmail in order to sort your email. So that's a that's actually a really important thing that you need to do is learn how to manage your email. Read and respond appropriately. Whether it's emails from faculty members about class or whether it's finding a research experience but this is going to be moving towards um, communicating and finding a research experience so once you've managed learned to manage your email then what okay so now you want to communicate with a faculty member um, about your interest in research so first of all again taking a step forward in time we're going to talk about um, profiling a faculty member and profiling their research and making sure that you are on top of what they do. But then you're going to send them an email and you're going to say, hey, uh, dear Dr. Schenk, I'm interested in doing research with you. Uh, this is, I know that you do research in this and this is what I'm interested in or whatever. Um, or sure, it is okay to say, hey, you know, I'm really just just putting out feelers and I know this is what you do certainly love to learn more about it um, you know you don't have to necessarily say oh I really want to do X you can absolutely say hey I know this is what you do and it sounds interesting I'm willing to do anything because you know I'm just trying to figure out wh which way I'm going that, that that's okay um, it's certainly sometimes better to just say I really want to do X especially if you know you want to do it um, but but email communications, let's just talk a little bit about email communications, maybe some of the obvious stuff. Like, um, don't address, how do you address an email? How do you address an email? I mean, me, meaning like, what's your, what's your, uh, your uh, greeting, your greeting line? You know, hey prof, hey doctor. Um, no, don't do that, right? I don't know, what do you do? Um, when you communicate with a faculty member and you have a question about class, I mean, you know, and you're, you're emailing them, um, you know, hey, mm -mm, not appropriate. Not even appropriate when you're asking questions about class. It's not appropriate. Uh, students do it all the time. Uh, I would suggest that you always uh, begin an email by addressing the person that you're sending the email to um, by their appropriate name. Uh, so it's a, if it's a faculty member, it's uh, doctor or professor, uh, Sheldon, Schenk, Soika, uh, Bliss, etc. Um, right. So so it's uh, dear Doctor Bliss, dear Professor Hulahan. Um, doesn't matter. Professor, Doctor. Some people have preferences. Most of us don't. Um, but it's. Uh, uh, you can use the the greeting you know word dear or whatever the appropriate word is um, dear Dr. Du Houlihan um, or it's just Dr. Houlihan comma um, so first of all that that is that's important and and we as faculty members notice that we, we do we notice that and uh, we know that various students use different ways of addressing us and we notice when it uh, seems strangely familiar or um, or, or professional <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily change anything for us when we're in class with you, but uh, but we do notice it. And my suggestion is, it's always um, addressing us by name uh, with the um, doctor or professor in front of it. Um, and then again, you know, whether it's the the traditional dear Dr. Sheldon um, or whether it's just Dr. Sheldon, uh, it, that's fine. But hey, is probably not a pro an appropriate uh, way to address a faculty member. Um, so then, then you know, so then the email, so you really do want to think about when you're sending an email. Again, your email is like your cover letter, right? Your email is like your cover letter. When you're trying to find um, an appropriate research experience, you, you want to um, write a, a cover letter, right? Dear Dr. Sheldon, um, you know, I'm, I'm writing to you because I'm interested in doing research and finding out more about what you do. I know that you do this kind of research, blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, you want to write a complete, uh, write in complete sentences, write in complete paragraphs. You don't want it to be too long, definitely not. But but make it a professional, um, professional sounding email, um, and sign off at the end. You know, um, with your name. Um, actually, it's uh, amazing the number of times I get emails uh, from students that they don't sign their name to. 
Um, sure, you say, well, you can see my email address. Well, yes, I can, <laughs> but it's still very odd to me to get an email from a student where they don't sign their name. I mean, it just, it's just, it's very, very informal, um, and uh, sometimes they are seem to be um, uh, even hard to read because they're lacking information. It's really, um, it's a good habit to get into to start with, even if, no matter who you're writing to, you know, um, Dear, uh, I don't know if if you call Megan Fallon by her first name or her last name. Some of you are on a first name basis with her, but you know if you're writing to the director of the CDC, it's Dear Megan, blah 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 blah. Here's why I'm writing you. I really want to. If you can you help me with my resume? Thank you, comma Peter. Right? You're you're um you're at the end. It's a, a thank you probably, um and sign your name. Make it a complete a complete thought. Right? When you leave off the signing of your way, name, when you leave off the dear uh, Megan at the, at the beginning, it just doesn't feel like a complete thought. It feels like it's something that you're just off the cuff sending off and it, it doesn't feel very professional. You really need to get into the habit of sending professional emails, regardless of who you're sending to, whether you're asking the registrar to help you add a course, whether you're asking the Career Development Center to um, help you with a resume, or whether you're asking a faculty member for help in a class, or whether you're asking a faculty member for um, information on doing research. You really should get into the habit of writing complete and professional emails.